works in our life. It's how faith works. God said it, I believe it. Now I say it, and it's done. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. Turn around and shake hands, somebody. You can be seated. Praise the Lord. It's a good song. I like songs that's faith songs that when you sing, you make a confession of your faith or you're releasing something or causing something to happen, you know. Amen. No need wasting our time. We need to accomplish something every time we come to church or every day when we get up. Amen. Either the day runs you or you run the day. It's whatever you want to do. Amen. Well, I'm glad you all come to church. Thank you for coming. That other bunch laid out. Well, <laughs> thank you for coming. Amen. And being at church. Ray and I can sit back there in the office and have a good time, and, and we, we'll be blessed, but we do this for the people. Do it for you. There's something involved in it. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and receive our offerings tonight. Actually, it goes to Ray. Praise the Lord, and we bless him. We want to bless him. Praise God. You know, in, over in the book of Genesis, God gave man three things uh, to be involved with him on the earth to accomplish his task and to fulfill what he wanted done and to bless man. He gave him, first of all, he blessed man. He gave him the blessing. He blessed him. Then he gave him authority. He gave man authority. Then he gave us something that we should live by and we would live by and we sustain ourselves, sustain ourselves and prosper as much as we want to. It's seed, time, and harvest. That's how everything works in the kingdom. Seed, time, and harvest. Now, being a country boy and growing up on a farm, I understand that completely. If you want to live good, we planned, my dad did, third grade education. He figured out how much he needed to live, to feed the family, have all he needed to pay the bills. He got paid once a year, once a year when we sold our crops. That's how much we lived at the general store. The rest of the year on a credit account. He would in the in the fall and winter and pay off his bill. And so he had to figure how much he needed, how much the crop had to be and all. So he planned in the spring what he needed in the fall. And so being a good farmer, he knew how much seed would produce, so he prepared that much ground. Then he sowed that much seed. Because he knew that seed, time, and harvest paid his bills and caused him to live good. And if he wanted more, he planted more. That's very simple, isn't it? But how come we can't get it? And when we come down to God said, that's how my kingdom works. Everything in the kingdom works that way. You decide how much you want to live or what you need. You determine your own prosperity. My daddy did, third grade education. Of course, the more you plant it, the more work is involved. We grew tobacco and we grew everything you grow that it make money off of. Seed, time, and harvest. So when it come into the Bible and I saw that and understood that, and I said, well, I, can, I understand that completely. That's how it works. So I jumped in with the sowing. And I've lived my life based on seed. If I want something and I need something, then I sow a seed. I plant a seed. And I believe that seed will produce what I need. Amen? Seed. And God gives seed to the sower. And he blesses the seed sown. And he said, you will have sufficiency in everything, plus you'll have more than enough left over to have something to give to every good work. 
based on a seed. How hard is that? But when it comes to money, it's hard for us. We can't see it as seed. Money is not seed because you can't plant it. But it becomes seed when you put faith with it and the Word of God. It's the Word of God that produces, not the money. And you take the money and you give it according to the Word of God, and the more you give, the more it produces. It becomes a seed then when you give it to God in faith. Then it becomes a seed. And that money you give can be a house, can be a car, can be a healing, can be all kinds of things in that seed, that money. Wow. Everything I got, I got that way. Still live that way. Seed. Time and heart. So God said, whatever you want, it's up to you. Don't get mad at me if you're not prospering. Just sow more seed. Are you out there? Father, we bless you tonight. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that we can predetermine uh, this seed what we need. How much do we need? How much do we need to pay our bills? How much do we need to prosper? I want more than enough, so I'm going to sow more than enough. I'm not just going to plant a field that gets just gets me by and feeds me. I'm going to have more than enough, and I'm going to have abundant crop and I'm going to have enough for every good work what you said in your word it's your word God we believe it's not money we don't believe in money we believe your word and we thank you Lord for the harvest now as we plant the seed you'll cause it to grow in Jesus mighty name amen amen all right Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies. Hey, you better catch up a little bit. <laughs> They're running off of either. Well, go ahead. They'll go back there and count it now. Well, glory be to God. Wasn't last night good? Wasn't it good? You know, one word from heaven changed your life. One word. And God sees our heart, sees whether or not we're hungry. He sends his word, and it'll change your life. Never underestimate the power of one meeting you attend. My life has changed and, and turned around by being in meetings, being under the preached word. It'll change your life. You know that. So there's a special blessing for you here tonight. I guarantee it. You watch God do something special in your life. Amen? All right. Ray, come on, brother. Bless us real good. Hallelujah. Love you, Love you Pastor. Thank, Thank you. you. Praise God, everybody. Amen. Isn't God good? Come on, praise him like you mean it. Father, we give you praise and glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your greatness and who you are. You are king, a very king. Your train still fills the temple. Lord Jesus, the angels still rejoice. Hell still shakes and the earth is still your, your footstool. I thank you, Lord, that in this day, nothing has changed. You are still in control. It is your day. It is not the Antichrist day. It is your day. Rule and reign and have your way. Thank you that you still break down the chains. You still free your people out of prisons. Lord, you are still taking care of us, and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Open, Lord, now the eyes of our understanding to see what you have written for us in these scriptures. We thank you for the greatness of your place. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Praise God. Go ahead and be seated if you would. Did you bring a Bible? Well, let's get after it. Go with me if you would to Acts chapter 6. Hallelujah. Kind of 
hit around this a little bit last night. Felt like we better dive in a little bit more serious here tonight. Praise God. Amen. I'll just tell you about a CD real quick, and then we'll get on. I, I mentioned my book last night. It's come to my attention that there's some typos in that book, so I am getting it reprinted. So if you bought the book and that annoys you, contact me in about a week or so, and I will have a fresh book for you, and I'll send you the new one. Amen. If you don't notice a typo, you're more like me. Amen. And hallelujah. But there are some people that it just ruins their day if everything isn't just exactly so. Amen. And uh, we love them too. Praise God. Amen. I always figure, you know, golf was invented by the devil, I'm pretty sure. I figure if I'm anywhere within 10 feet, that's good enough. We're done. Amen. Go home. But that ain't the way the game is played. Hallelujah. Thus the reason I only play it once a year. Acts chapter 6, are you there? Amen. I want to take the topic that we hit on a little bit last night and kind of drill down a little bit deeper if we can. Is that all right? And um, when, I, when I mention that phrase, you know, the things of the Spirit are caught, not taught. Say that with me. The things of the Spirit are caught, not taught. We can talk to you about them, we can teach them to you, but you'll catch more if you're just in the right atmosphere for it. Amen? As great as the live streaming is in modern technology, it's not the same as being here. Amen? I like the, the person that said, you know, it's like watching a fireplace over the internet. It looks good, but you don't get very warm. Amen? Next time there's a church fellowship and everybody bakes a pie, you stay home and watch it on the internet. Tell me how it tastes. Praise God. It's a little bit different than being here. And yet, if you can't get here, it is better than nothing at all. Hallelujah. I think it's when people make excuses and they could be here, and they say, well, I live streamed it. Somehow, eating popcorn and sitting around in your pajamas don't strike me as much of a church service, but praise the Lord. Amen. Acts chapter 6. Um, actually, let's, let's go chapter 7, and then we'll back up a little bit. Chapter 7, verse 54. We're going to talk about Stephan a little bit and these, how these things are the Spirit and the miracles of God. Um, in Acts 6, Stephan does, does his speech, 6 chapter, and into chapter 7. We'll read that in a little bit. But at the end, it, it says this. It says, And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Now, that's not a very good response to your sermon. Amen. But sometimes people do get mad when you preach the truth. We're, in case you haven't realized that, that's most of our society right now. Amen? Paul even said, "Why, if I preach the truth to you, why am I now your enemy? Amen? I, I don't get it. In other words, he's saying, I told you the truth and you're mad at me. People lie to you and you like them. Don't act like you don't have it happening here, amen, in the holy city of Asheville. Praise God. Amen? says, and they were cut to the heart. I, I read this phrase, and that's when I said to the Lord, where did Stephen learn to preach that the Holy Spirit, say the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The Holy Spirit began to work with him. You don't do this because you're a good orator, a good speaker. You know what I'm talking about? This happens because God is walking and talking to people and convicting their heart while you're preaching. Go back with me to Acts chapter 2. We'll establish some of these things in the scriptures, and then we'll, we'll move on. Acts chapter 2, most people know this story. It's when Peter comes out of the upper room on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit's poured out. And it says this um, in verse 36. It says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. See, it's the exact same thing that happened when Peter preached as happened when Stephen preached. Uh, here's my point. Stephen isn't preaching the same thing. He isn't repeating Peter's sermon. Make sense? But it's the same spirit that worked with Peter is now working with Stephen. That's the helps ministry to me. That the same anointing or the same Holy Spirit, I should say, that gets on your pastor can get on the people. Amen? 
that the same spirit that called him called the people who work in children's ministry, called the people who work security. Amen? That it, it's, a, it's a like spirit. Does that make sense to you? Now, we were talking about this a little bit at lunch, at least I was, and they were hearing it, so I'll make it sound like they were in on it. <laughs> I am concerned it, that so many ministries, churches, have turned to not so much to praise or, or prayer and consecration, but they turn to technology every time they need something. Make sense? Every time you turn around, it's another reel on the internet. It's another something on the web. And I'm not against talking about what God's doing. Don't get me wrong. But they almost lean on that like horses and chariots. And the Bible says if you lean on horses and chariots instead of God, you'll be in trouble in the day of battle. Amen? But it's so easy now to become, I mean, for lack of a better word, the hip thing, the in thing, Right? The problem with that is that's not how God moves. God doesn't care about what's popular with people. God cares about what he said, and are you doing it or are you not? Amen. That's what David got into. That's what we were talking about last night. Are you with me? I'm going to give you one of my favorite Holy Ghost testimonies, all right? You were talking about Dr. Hagen. We were both fans of, I think, most people that got filled with the Holy Spirit. At some point, Brother Hagen touched a lot of our nation and a lot of other countries. But I was, I was talking to a, a pastor friend of mine one time, and I, he actually went to Ramah. I did not. The Lord didn't send me there, so I never went. And that good advice. It's a, I didn't say it's a bad school. It's just not where God sent me. God sent me to Dr. Barclay. That's why I hooked up there. And my prayer was, just so you know, my prayer was, God, when he called me, he said, I want you to teach. I said, you have to send me to somebody who's doing this right, because I don't know anything I'm doing. I'm sure that was not news to God. <laughs> but I felt obligated to say it just the same. Amen. That's when I said, you have to give me a pastor is what I was saying. And if he'll show me what to do, I'll do it. But I'm not going to go do things that are wrong because I don't know any better. And then next year I got to come fix the mess I just made. Because if I knew at the beginning, I would never teach the wrong thing. But everybody's human. Amen. So I found pastor in 1987. I stayed in his church until 91 when I hired on staff, and I worked for him directly for 13 years until 2004. That's when I started my own traveling ministry. Well, brother, if you don't have it down after 13 years, you just need to go home. Amen? It finally came the time where I thought, okay, now I got I to gotta go. I can't stay here. Amen? Back to Dr. Hagen. So I was talking to a pastor friend of mine. I said, why did you end up going to that Bible school? He said, you know, Brother Ray, he said, the first time I went to his winter Bible seminar, he says, I wasn't right with God. He said, my brother and my sister-in-law were, they were in the ministry. He said, I went with them to go down to Ramah to go to the winter Bible seminar. He said, but he said, I wasn't going to the seminar. I was going because there was a girl I knew who was also going to the seminar. Enough said. Not a good reason to go to the seminar. He said, so we parked across the street because the parking lot was packed. He said, I, I arrived. I hadn't met up with her yet. He said, I arrived with my brother, my sister-in-law. And he said, we, we parked across the street. And when I walked across the street and my foot just got, came up to the, the curb, you know what I'm talking about, out on the road. I don't know what it is, four or five lane road in front of the, the place. He said, as soon as my foot hit the sod, the power of the Holy Ghost hit me out there on the, on the lawn. And he said, it hit me so hard, I grabbed my chest and I began to weep over my sin. And he said, out there, he said, I knelt in the side and I wept and I wept uncontrollably over how evil I was living and my plan to sin instead of my plan to come here and get the Holy Ghost. And he said, I repented and I repented and I broke it off and I never contacted her. And he said, and by the end of that seminar, I was enrolled in Rhema Bible Training Center as a student. Now, here's my point. You don't have those kinds of miracles because you have a good digital program on Facebook. That's true, absolute, undeniable Holy Ghost. Folks, that's what I'm talking about. When I talk about the helps ministry, that's what I want. Absolutely true, undeniable, God is moving. Say, God, we are not making this up. That's the spirit that I am of. I'll give you another testimony, and then I'll move on. 
When I first began working for Dr. Barclay, I was there maybe a year, two years. There was a kind of a hole in the calendar, you know. Sometimes it wasn't as busy as what you would have liked for it to have been, just like you'd like to have more people in the church. You know what I mean? It's just, if you run a business, you understand there's ebbs and flows. It's not nine to five solid paycheck every week. Sometimes it's good, sometimes not. So you just got to be okay with that. Amen? Prayerfully, you get to where it's always profitable, but you just have days. So kind of one of those seasons going on. Somebody from the financial office came down and shut the door in my, my office. I was pretty new. They said, now, Brother Ray, they said, you got to get Dr. Barclay some meetings and get him out there preaching. Okay, well, I was new, so I didn't know no better. I, I Like it fell on me. It's not my ministry. I don't tell the man what to do, and they better not either. Hallelujah. Right. And, but I felt bad. A little bit while later, pastor called me to ask some other questions, and he said this. He said, how come you are so sad? I said, how can you tell I'm sad off of the word hello? <laughs> he said, Ray, I really am a prophet. What's going on? <laughs> I said, well, can you turn down the x-ray vision for just a minute? <laughs> for a guy to be, is this okay to talk like this? Yeah. For a guy to just be normal around here? Wow, have I always got to, you're, you're going to know? Hallelujah. <laughs> so, so I said, well, we got to get you some meetings. Without hesitation. Oh, he said the financial department's been talking to you, have they? Wow. He knew that ministry like the back of his hand. He knew where that was coming from. He said, get your gear, which I, I kept a list of invitations on my, cal on my computer, and I, I had a, a map we kept in my office with pins and everywhere he would preach. So when we were in an area, we tried to make sure and at least call the other brothers, even if he wasn't going to be preaching for them, so they would know he was in the area and maybe come out to the meetings. And he wanted to be their pastor. Amen. Even though he wasn't preaching for them, he's still their friend. Hallelujah. It wasn't pushing for a meeting. It's being relational. So <clears throat> I was set that all up and I was in his office. And before I could ever start, or I could ever start, he, he shut everything down. He said, now listen to me. I have not now. I never will in the future. I never have in the past preached for money. Never. It's never going to happen. He said, you tell me who's called. I'll tell you what the Spirit of the Lord is telling me to do. And that's what we're doing. If every time there's a need, the devil finds he can make me run and chase my tail, it'll never end. And he said, I will always be running after some need, and I'll get totally out of the will of God. He said, no, I'm not going to live like that. And he said, what they don't know is that this morning, somebody gave me a check for $10,000 to pay all of the ministry needs. The goal, and this is what he always taught me, the goal is not to be out doing what everybody wants. The goal is to be doing what he wants. And if I'm doing what he wants, the money will find us. We'll always be okay. But if we chase it, you're going to get yourself out of the will of God, even though you're doing good things. I'm talking about pure, true Holy Spirit. That's what attracted me to Mark Barclay Ministries. That true, pure, say pure, pure move of the Holy Spirit. I have a CD back there. I just call it gold versus bronze. When the temple, when Solomon turned over the temple, the Rehoboam, the Egyptians came in and they raided the temple and they stole some of the gold out. That was a type and shadow of the anointing in the house. Rehoboam didn't want to pay the price to get gold back, so he took, he took bronze, and he, he, or brass rather, and he put it in the temple and they just shined it up and pretended it was gold. That's what we have going on in the church now. People don't want to go back to prayer and fasting and spend time on their knees before a holy God. We'll just pretend we had a miracle. We'll hype it up and we'll put it on the internet. We'll put it on the web. But we didn't really pray to have one. We just said we did. I don't want to live like that. I don't know about you. You can. I don't want to. I want to have a true move of the Spirit. So my question becomes, what did Peter do that God, say God, God began to work with this fisherman and he began to convict the hearts of people to where they were cut by the same Holy Spirit that had changed his life. How did Stephen, 
get that Holy Spirit to work with him the same way he saw it work with Peter, James, and John when he came in and he began to take care of the widows in the church. You see what I'm talking about? How can I, as a helps person, find the same Holy Spirit that he found? Not to, not to replace him, but to help him. Amen? We're gonna, it, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But folks, that's where I'm headed with this sermon. I, whether or not you like me or what I've done or where I'm from, I, I don't care. It it's none of my business. But I will tell you how I found the Holy Spirit and what he's done in my life. Amen? Can I give you one more testimony and then we'll move on? I'm in the Philippines preaching a while back. And they take me to a different church. I don't know any of these people. I'd never met them. Have you met very many people in the Philippines? <laughs> me neither. I'm a redneck. We don't talk to very many people over there. So, I'm in the Philippines. They take me to this church. I don't speak any Filipino, Tagalog it's called. I don't speak any of their language. They bring me in the pulpit. So I start preaching on the ministry of helps because that's what I do. I'm, I'm a novelty, I'm speaking English, and so, you know, for a little while, I've got everybody's attention, but over the course of time, I can see the teenagers in the back, they're not paying attention. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I got this much figured out. They don't care about what I have to say. And for whatever reason, I just within myself while I preached, I said, you know, I don't even care. I love this sermon. I'm going to just preach this to me. I, I love what God's done in my life. Just hallelujah. So I'm preaching on the ministry of helps. I'm preaching about helping your pastor. I'm talking about the gift or the anointing that's inside of your pastor that's there for you. Don't worry about, I call it the wrapping paper. And I always give the illustration of, you know, at Christmas, my kids never cared about how my wife wrapped the gifts. They didn't care. And my wife always was neat. It always had to have the right color bow and the right color wrapping paper. And if you could see tape, it is a sin unto death. It has to be <laughs> hidden. And I am not allowed to wrap the gifts. But in seconds, my kids will shred that paper. My son has never turned to my daughter and said, look at the way mom wrapped this. I'm not opening it. He didn't care. I told her once, I said, why don't you do like Walmart? Ask the kids if they want paper or plastic this year. It's just a waste of your time to do all of this. But in the church, we're not looking at the gift. We want it wrapped just the right way. It's got to have the right color on it. It's got to have the right suit. It's got to have the right this, the right that. The children's church worker, the praise and worship people, they have to be just right or we can't receive from them. We're so far off of where heaven is trying to get us centered in on. We're losing the very anointing that God put in the house for his people. So I'm in the Philippines and I'm preaching away and I get done and I'm talking about the gift, receive the gift of the pastor. Don't worry about any of that. And I go to turn it over to the pastor when I'm done, and he is weeping on the front row. I mean, not, not a few tears. I mean, he is a grown man weeping on the front row. And I said, you know, pastor, just come on up here. Let's everybody give him a good hand clap. You know what we ought to do today, everybody? We ought to just give pastor an offering. If you got any cash for pastor, you just bring it up here. And the people came from everywhere. Now, I mean, he is a puddle on the front altar. I am holding this man up. His wife is there. They are holding each other up. I can't figure out what's going on. In their church, he was not the original pastor. The original pastor was a man who was an engineer who had gotten saved. He had the church for a season, but then he moved on and he turned it over to this other pastor. In Asia in general, in the Philippines especially, education isn't just something you do. It is the thing. If you can get an education, it elevates you. So to them, their last pastor being an engineer, he drew all kinds of sophisticated people from the community. That's fine. That's wonderful. I'm for everybody getting saved. But the pastor that was sitting on the front row, he was a street preacher. He had been a, a homeless person on the streets of Manila, drug addict, drug addict. And he got marvelously saved, marvelously delivered from drugs and alcohol. He was a demon chasing, Holy Ghost preaching, fireball for Jesus Christ. I, I'm serious. He could get rats saved in the gutters of Manila. <laughs> that man, he just, everything was about souls. He was wonderful. But because he wasn't sophisticated, the leadership of that church wanted to drive him out and they hadn't paid him for a long time. His family hadn't eaten for two weeks. 
precious people. And here I am talking about the gift of the pastor and you don't worry about the wrapping paper on the outside. And the first people to come up there and put an offering in his hand was that board that hadn't paid him in so long. We took his children out for dinner. They hadn't eaten in two weeks, and we fed them the best we could. He cried the entire time. So, Brother Ray, where did you learn to do that? Ushery. Rowing boats like Peter. Running errands. Getting woke up at middle of the night, odd hours. Can you do this? Can you do that? I'm as busy as everybody else. I don't have time to do all of that. I just made time. My pastor friend Chuck Moore said it this way the other day. I thought it was so good. He said, you cannot build a church on convenience. I'm going to say it again. You cannot say not. You cannot build a church on convenience. If you want to have a house of God, you're going to sooner or later get inconvenienced. There's no way around it. God is going to show up on your job like he did with Moses. You want to keep taking the sheep and earning your pay? You're going to turn around to this. You're going to turn to this burning bush. Because you can't do both. You can't do both. Sooner or later, you got to pick and choose. God called me into the ministry. Boss, I love you. Time for me to move on. Amen. You leave, you leave right. I'm talking about not be dishonorable. But you understand, you got to follow that grace and that anointing, what God has on your life. Aren't we all glad that he did? He wrote the first five books of the Bible. Hallelujah. But my, my point is, that's the Holy Ghost I'm after, that anointing. That's what I want. Amen. When I got filled with the Holy Spirit that night, I, I went to go see my wife, Janine. We were just dating. Back then, you know, I'm so old, I predate cell phones and texting. I know I'm, kids think they've been around forever. Amen. I said to my son Nathan once, I said, you're fortunate you know your grandparents. I barely knew mine. And uh, he said, well, why didn't you email them? So you should run really fast right now. Amen. <laughs> Told another young guy, I said, you sound like a broken record. He said, what's a record? <laughs> Am I that old? Is it that bad? Hallelujah. But my, my point is, is that as I went to go see Janine that night, because I was so, so overwhelmed to get filled with the Holy Spirit, as I walked along, I looked up into the sky and the stars began to move and I had an open air vision. And they aligned themselves into a seven and then into a cross and they flashed back and forth kind of like flashers would on your car. And I didn't even know what it meant, but seven nights later, my wife got filled with the Holy Spirit. That was the beginning of the true move of the Spirit that we began to see. That's what I was hungry for. I don't care if you're famous or popular. Is God working with you? Because that's what I'm after. Now look what happens here in Acts chapter 6. Stephen comes into this church. We'll pick it up in verse 8. And he comes in to just take care of the widows. That doesn't seem like a big spiritual something to do, but he just gets busy in his church. Verse 8 in Acts chapter 6 at 7 says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Look at this deacon. He's not even the preacher. And signs and wonders are coming from his ministry. Verse, verse 9 talks about these people who rose up and began to argue with him. In verse 10 it says, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. This isn't even the pastor. But he has so much Bible in him and such an anointing on him that even though they hate him, they can't argue with the wisdom that he has. This is when I said, God, where did he learn this? And that's when the Lord told me, he said he caught this from being with Peter. Peter caught it being with Jesus. That's the beauty of the ministry of helps. As you start getting around and helping in the house of God, God gets involved and starts helping you. God is the best at setting up win-win situations. You let him work in your boat, he'll fill it with fish. Amen? You, you let him do something in, with your children, God will bless those kids. You bring them to the house of God, and, and eventually God begins to work with those kids. Hallelujah. They become leaders in the church. They become spiritual giants. They, they begin to find God. Look at that. So they're not able to resist. Let's read this in verse 11. Keep going. <clears throat> Then they secretly induce men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. 
They set false witnesses who said, This man does not cease but to speak blasphemous words against his holy place in the law, none of which was true, but they said it anyways. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses, which were delivered to us. 15. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. It's actually fairly similar to what happened to Moses. He's a deacon. But the same spirit that worked with Moses, the same spirit that worked with Jesus, that raised him from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that began to work with Peter, James, and John, is now starting to get on Stephen. See what I'm talking about? Wouldn't you be a great business owner? if the Holy Spirit would anoint you to do business the way the Holy Spirit anoints this man to preach? That your competitors can't keep up with you? People lying about you can't keep up with you? That you're like a Daniel, they have to make laws against your God because they know you're not stealing things to get you in trouble with the boss? And even when they do and they plot your demise, God uses it for your promotion and you come out better on the other end of it? God's a really good person to come to know. He's really, really good at this, folks. It doesn't matter if you're not called to the ministry. Whatever you give God room to work with in your life, he's going to bless it and begin to take care of you in it. Can you say amen? amen. This, this in mind, go with me to Matthew, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 16. Pick it up here at verse 13. Say it with me again. The things of the Spirit are caught, not taught. Amen? There is teaching involved, but you're going to catch them from being around the things of God. Amen? Look at 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And he said to him, and so they said, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, now every time Peter says something, you almost got to kind of brace yourself, don't you? Because he does really good and then he does really bad. Look at this, it says, it says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Had Jesus taught him he was the Messiah? Jesus never said those words. So Peter caught what Jesus hadn't taught. See what I'm saying? God, what he's saying to him is, is, what you said is true, but I didn't say that. He said that. You didn't connect with me, you, connect, you connected with my God. This is now Peter, this is what Elijah, Elisha was talking about when he said, what did I do to you? I'm not the one who just made you feel that anointing. That's him. You're going to walk with, you're going to be a prophet, you're going to get used to him. Or you won't make it as a prophet. Amen? What's, what's Jesus saying to Peter? You are now connecting. This is what I'm after in all of my disciples. You're connecting with God who sent me, not me. Amen? This, this is the better of the two options. Yes, yeah, pastor. Yes, Jesus is leading. Yes, but it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's on him that's now beginning to direct the people around him. David's mighty men weren't wonderful because God anointed them to be king. God anointed them to establish David as king. All of, all of Moses' leadership that came to him in, in Numbers chapter 11, God put his anointing on him, not to replace him as the pastor, but to establish him as the pastor. The anointing doesn't come on you to, to be the pastor, be the prophet of the house. It comes to establish what God's already doing in the house. Make sense? It's a support to it. But every joint supplies, every person has to supply something to make, to make the ministry go. 
I've always said that, you know, there's one place in the Old Testament when they wanted to build the temple, they, God said, go get me a bunch of badger skins. Now, you wonder why some people are in the church until you need a whole wall full of badger skins. You better find a redneck somewhere who knows how, how to go catch badgers out in the wilderness. Amen? Chances are they're a little different than the average person on the front row. But we need you. Can you say amen? And all of these things, see, all of these things became necessary as they became a team. Say a team. They became a team together for their God. And Peter, and I said it last night, but I'll say it again. He is not a Pharisee. He's not trained in the books that the Pharisees were. He's not a, a, a teacher of the law. We say lawyer, we think of a modern civil lawyer, but the law in their day was the Old Testament law, right? That the, the priest or the Levite, when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, he talks about a, the, the priest, the Levite, and, and the lawyer. He's talking about people they would commonly see in leadership down in the temple. Peter's none of those. But he's figured out who the Messiah is, and Caiaphas, the high priest, can't. He's a God of the common man. You don't have to be the most sophisticated anything to get the Holy Ghost to work with you. You can be, but God wants to work with the common man. God wants to work with the common man. I was, I was living in a trailer. I had a college degree, called to the ministry, and I couldn't get anything to work, nothing. Janine and I were married. We had two kids, one, one son, one daughter. I think Nathan was three and Kendra was maybe one at the time. She was just maybe, maybe a little bit older than that. And in our church, pastor said, we're going to try to pay off the church building. And the idea was if you went to the store to go buy something and you found out it was on sale, you took whatever money you were going to spend anyways, right? They have a two for one's whopper sale and you know you take the money you would have spent on the second whopper and you take that and you put it on the building and then he said we'll believe god that by the end of the year amen you can you can put five thousand dollars on the church building so that sunday came and they passed out those those cards and they were perforated so you put your name and such on there so they knew who was pledging they get their faith with you on that pastor always laid hands on those and prayed over the people and uh, then you kept the, the rest of it was like a little log. You'd keep a record, $5 this Sunday, $25 the next Sunday or whatever. So I took my score sheet or whatever they gave you, your pledge card. And when they passed the bucket to receive it, I took my card and I put it in my Bible and took it home with me because I wasn't pledging $5,000 because I don't have it. I'm living in a trailer that I paid about 90, I think just under $10,000 for it. The payments were $248 a month and I could hardly make them. The pipes freeze, mice were in the walls. It was awful. Brother, I'm, not, I'm talking it was hard. I'm married to the girl of my dreams and I don't have 10 cents to my name. I walked away from my, from my job and all my profession to be in the ministry and I can't make anything work. It's a very frustrating place to live. I know all of you are rich, but I'm telling you I wasn't. So I'm, I took that scorecard and I took it home and I was actually headed, I was in pastor's car to go pick him up from the airport as an usher in the church. And I'm in that car and the Holy Spirit starts talking to me. He said, I want you to pledge to the building program. I said, God, I don't have $5,000. You can look in every account I've got. I know what's in them, it ain't much. I don't even think I have to take off my shoes to count. I mean, I just, that's how much I got. He said, I want you to pledge $5,000 to the building program. I said, I don't have $5,000 to the building program. If I had it, you could have it. But if I pledge and I don't do it, now I'm worse than an infidel because I haven't kept my pledge. But it's not because I don't want to, because I don't have it. Did you ever have your father say your whole name? And you almost kind of brace yourself, like, I better cover up. I promise you. He said, Raymond. Oh, that brought back bad memories. Raymond. I want, I said, okay, 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 okay. When I get home, I'll pledge $5,000 to the building program. I'll tell Janine we're going to pledge $5,000 to the building program. And he said these words, a piece. You know, when you're new, you can say things you can't say after a while. But I was still pretty new. 
I said, Lord, you're everywhere. You go home and tell Janine. <laughs> Is it okay for me to be that real with you? you? How do you tell the girl of your dreams? I got pipes freezing, mice in the wall. One night a mouse hit the trap. And, and I, she said, oh, good, it's dead. And then I heard it dragging the trap across <laughs> the kitchen floor. It wasn't all the way dead. This is the girl. I got, one time a skunk got in our trailer. And, you know, when a, the furnace kicked on, it had banged, and it scared the skunk. I was at church. I get a call. They said, you know, Brother Ray, your wife's called, your trailer's on fire, which part of me said, good, I hate that trailer. <laughs> but then I did have a wife and two kids in there. They were homesick. I think Nathan was throwing up and Kendra had diarrhea. And I'm at church. I don't have 10 cents to my name. And I get this call, your trailer's on fire. What else? So, man, I, I got out of the church and I left and I tear down the road and you know, our church is on a two-lane road. I was, at that time, I was the only person that lived north of the church, the only person. And so I went out, and I started my car, and I head up the road, and I look in my rearview mirror, and the whole church, because me and this usher, we were both tall, so tall people, we didn't have our own conversation up here. Right. Amen? And, but the short people overheard us. And so, you know, they, they're my friends, and so they, they well, we're going to go help with the fire at the bench trailer. And so I, I pull in my driveway and I look, you know, the church is following me up the road and I pull in the driveway. I'm looking for flames, smoke, fire, anything. Janine's standing on the front porch holding both kids, tears coming down her eyes. I said, why did you call? I don't see. And then I smelt it. That skunk had got underneath. When that furnace kicked on, it scared that skunk, that bang that it made. And the skunk pitched and delivered, he hit a strike right on the intake of that furnace and it sucked it into the furnace and it burnt it and it blew it through the whole trailer. There I am standing on the porch with my sick son, my sick daughter, my, my wife crying, my trailer smelling like skunk and the entirety of Living Word Church is driving in the driveway. Ain't it grand to be a Christian, ain't it grand? And God wants $10,000. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can I be real with you? Well, Brother Hagin used to say, God loves a cheerful giver, but he will receive from a grouch. <laughs> I was the grouch. Do you know, over the course of the year, just before the 52 weeks was up, I brought in $5,000. My wife was just about on the one-year mark, and the benches had put $10,000 into the building program. And I realized once I learned the system, I paid off that trailer, sold it, and bought my house. That was my out. I sold that house, and I built a new house, and, and, and I'm happy there. Don't need to move again. Do you understand? that? What God was doing is saying, your brain is lying to you. And he knew it. Your brain is, when I went to go, I don't know about anybody else, I can't get on this for long. But when I went to go sell my trailer, my father called me and said, who do you think you are that's good enough for you? I know the spirit of poverty, it was all around me. If you tried to break out of it, they'd lecture you. My pastor called me from Canada and told me about how to get out of it, and my own father called me and said, I'm not good enough. Do you understand? I know, I know God has used that man to help bless my life. He, he's the one who helped me be in the ministry. He's the one that God used to break me out of poverty. He, and giving to the house of God. All these things people talk about today, your church this and your church that, you're too late. I've already had my miracle. I've already been to the empty tomb. Jesus has already done his miracle in my life. Amen? You'll never convince me otherwise. I, I, I know the pure true, say the pure, the pure true move of the Spirit of God and what it's all about. What happened to Peter when he started rowing the boat? He started to see things other people didn't see. He started to know things common people didn't know. They should have known it, but they didn't get it, but the fishermen figured it out. 
The things of the Spirit are caught, not taught. I can teach it to you, and I can give you the verses, and I can tell you what God did in me, but that's not the same as what God will do through you. But if you get close enough to the man of God, if you'll get involved in the church and the giving and, and the fundraising and the different things that happen here, I don't know everything your church does, but if you'll get closer, say closer, then you'll see more. You know, you turn on your headlights to leave to go home. Your car lights don't show you all the way home. But if you'll drive to the, that first 50 feet or so, you'll see 50 more. Then you see 50 more. Then you see 50 more until you go miles and miles all the way back home. That's how it is working with the, in the helps ministry. You don't see everything. You don't understand everything. At times, I don't even agree with everything. What teenager agrees with get up and, and make your bed? But is it best for him? Sure it is. Jesus took Peter to places he had never seen before. That's why I love the story about Peter walking on the water because when Jesus taught him to walk on the water, Peter had been a fisherman. He had been on that water every day of his life. Never walked on it. And in one day, his leader, his pastor, shattered every limitation he had ever known. What if he had never followed Jesus? He would have sat there and said, I can't do that. And in a sense, he would have been right. But he would have never seen what God will do with a life that is totally, absolutely turned over to him. Can you say amen? We're talking about the helps ministry. Are you still with me? Yes. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Story about Joshua working with Moses. Now Amalek came and he, he fought with Israel at Rephidim in verse 9. Moses said to Joshua, choose some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Choose some who? Notice the women didn't get called to do the men's job. We're either going to be biblical or we're not, folks. I, I love my wife. I don't expect her to go to war for me. Amen? I don't know what is going on with this society, but we better get back to the book. Hallelujah. I love what Dr. Barkley says. I might be old school, but we know where to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll read on. Choose some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said. Read that with me. So what? Joshua did as Moses said. He didn't pray about it. He didn't ask for clarification. Are you sure, Pastor? He just did it. You can't preach that in every church because there are pastors at times. I'm like, ah, I think that's a little goofy. I don't think you deal with that here. I think you can relax and trust Pastor Pittman here. So Mo Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up onto the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands on one side and then on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Bible goes on and says, write this in a book for, for Joshua so he doesn't forget it. You ought to write your victories down too. You ought to write your victories down. You ought to keep a list. They used to say the shepherd's staff was actually had etches of all the different victories that the, they would have. That's why David said, my rod and my staff, they comfort me. Your rod and staff, they, your testimonies, they, they help me. They put faith in me. Amen. But you, I have a list of all of my miracles that God has done in my life. Speaking in tongues that one day was just a prayer, and then it happened. Getting married once was just a prayer, and then it happened. I remember being alone, wondering, would anybody ever want me? And when I met Janine, it was one of the single greatest days of my life. Amen? That she, she <laughs> I don't know if I believe it every day, but on that day, she was the answer to my prayer. Hallelujah. Finding my church, finding my pastor. First time I ushered. I remember the first sermon I ever preached. Those were all just things. At one time, they're just a dream and a prayer, and now they're a reality. You got to rehearse all of your victories in God every now and then. Amen? 
It says, you write this down as a memorial. So a lot of things you can pull out of this verse. You know, I've always thought that Aaron and Hur had such an easy duty. What's harder, go down to the valley and fight with Amalek for your life or go up there and hold pastor's arm up? But you know, we're a team. Everybody has a role to play and everybody isn't you, but you still need them. Amen? Here's my point. Do you ever notice that Joshua is going in as, and he's leading in the army? Think about what is Joshua's future? He's going to go in and he's going to be the leader of the Lord's army at Jericho in Joshua chapter 6. When he obeys Moses, God is getting Joshua ready for his future and he doesn't even know it yet. He doesn't know he's going to take over for Moses. He doesn't know he's going to be the leader to take the people into the promised land. All he knows is my pastor told me to do this and so I'm going to go do it. He doesn't know he's being groomed for his future and what God's doing. Can you say amen? What God was doing in Joshua's life is the same thing God was doing in Ray Bench's life. All the things I did thinking it was going to help the house of God turned around to help me. It began to bless me. It began to establish me. It began to, to teach me things, to set me free from that spirit of poverty, to break me loose from the limitations I had known, to, to help me do things. Amen? That I could, I could connect not just the pastor, but to pastor's God. Dr. Barclay was preaching to a pastor by the name of Jim Crabb down in Cincinnati, Ohio. Pastor Crabb was a wild man. We didn't do this in the Lutheran church. You understand what a stretch it was for me to be on the front row? Pastor Crabb, he had this, he had this guy named Donnie, and he, he played this B3 organ, you know? We didn't have those in the Lutheran church. The, and they, they'd preach and sing, and then they'd dance. And he had, he had one Marine guy, his name was Lenny, and when he, he'd get dancing, he'd kick real hard like a Marine, and he'd shout, Ow! <laughs> Pastor Crabb was dancing, he'd bouncing like a pogo stick back and forth. There's another guy by the name of Joe Candela, he'd get drunk in the Holy Ghost, he'd dance like Fred Astaire, he'd kind of sashay side to side. There's another guy, um, uh, um, I think it was Jerry, maybe Jimmy, but he was an alcoholic. He was a painter, and he, he got marvelously saved, just marvelously saved, saved. And when the Holy Ghost would hit him, he'd go, Jesus! <laughs> so Joe Sashay and Pastor Crabb's pogo stick, and Donnie's on the organ up there. Lenny's going, glory, and running across the front. And my little Lutheran mind is losing itself. All I know is I'm... Yeah, I didn't think they were crazy. I'm looking for somebody with a robe. I mean, we don't do this in my old church, amen? And I'm standing there, I know I'm with pastor, and he's not moving, and I'm like, where is the door? And in the middle of that, the Holy Spirit speaks to me, just as plain as the day. He says, I want you to notice that the prophets were always in charge of the kings, the civil leaders. Huh? He said, though they asked for a king, I never put the kings in charge of the prophets. The prophets always stayed in charge of the kings. Glory! <laughs> Jesus! And I realized the Holy Spirit was there in the middle of all of that craziness. So I turned to pastor and I told him, I didn't say the Lord spoke to me. I said, it strikes me. And he said, talk to me about that after church. So after church, we began to talk, and he began to break it down and, and explain things to me. Five, ten years began to come by, and the head judge in our city would call him and ask, can we meet for coffee, Dr. Barton? The civil leaders, uh, the, the judges, the attorney generals, and the prosecuting attorneys, rather, in our city would call and say, can you help me? He'd have a prophetic word at times for some of them and bless them and bring peace to a situation they didn't know what to do with. And God was, be but I knew that probably five, 10 years before it ever began to happen. Just like the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter and he said, this is the Christ, the son of the living God. That same God that worked with my pastor began to work with me to help my pastor. 
I remember political campaigns would call and want to talk to him and ask him to come support them. He'd say, no. No, you sold out the gospel. I'm not coming. But it would make him look famous. He'd say, I'm not for sale. I'm not for sale. People used to say he's in it for the money. I said, well, he's not very good at it. Because <laughs> he makes all the money people mad. But here he is helping the kid in the trailer. But I found the true, pure move of the Spirit. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like being able to, to sit down and to have heaven come into your prayer closet. To know the voice of the Almighty. To have the Lord begin to speak with you and to help you and to talk to you. I remember once the Lord told me to give a, a, a large sum of money and and when I finally got it all together, I, I, I was walking up my driveway. The last a bid had come in the mail that day. And, and I, I'm walking up the driveway. And we, we were just, I mean, just my business was in trouble. I had, I had started my ministry. I didn't have enough meetings to live on. And you're just kind of in between your dream and, and, when the, and your prayer time, right? It's supposed to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. That faith season. I know it all happens for you so quick, your miracle comes, but for me, it didn't. And I was living in, in that time, and, and the Lord told me to give this large sum of money. I, don't, I mean, my son's in flight school. My daughter's getting ready for nursing school. I don't have 10 cents to my name. We had just built that nice house I talked about. I'm concerned I'm going to lose it. You know, when you don't have anything, it's hard to lose it, but it's not as bad as when you finally got a little something, right? And we had... We were getting ready to go through all of that, and then the Lord wants us some money to be sewn into the ministry, and so I did. And I'll never forget walking up the driveway with that last check in my hand, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me. But he doesn't speak to me speaking to the spirit of poverty that's trying to speak to me. This is what he said. He said, you hear me, Satan. I will bless this man anytime he asks me to, and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. You know, the Bible says that Jesus made an open show of the devil, an open shame. He embarrassed him publicly. Why do you think God drugged Pharaoh down into the middle of the Red Sea? To make a statement. Leave my people alone. You don't want a war with me. I'm not like any warrior you've ever taken on. Trust me, that is still how God thinks right now. You don't want a war with me. You're not going to be happy. You almost wonder why God went through the 10 plagues. Why didn't he just go to the last one at the beginning? It's almost like he's trying to give Pharaoh, don't push me like this. You won't like it. Don't go there with me. Did you ever have your father say, you heard me? Oh, brother, brace yourself. I remember my father, my brother sassed my dad one time and my dad lit into him. I was about three years younger, and I just stood there, and I wrote myself, don't ever say that. <laughs> he hates that. That's what we're supposed to do when we look at the Old Testament. These were our examples, our, admin, our teaching. We're supposed to look at Sodom and Gomorrah and say, don't push God that far. He'll respond, but you won't like it. You won't like it. My point is this. Look what God did with Joshua. He is preparing him for his future and his tomorrows. Joshua is learning how to connect to the anointing. That helps time with Joshua. It isn't just helping Moses and the people. It's helping Joshua flow with and know God. That's why I got into the helps ministry. To help my pastor obey God and then for God to begin to speak to Ray Bench. The ministry of helps is a total, absolute win-win situation. If you'll get busy in the helps ministry, God will get busy helping you. Last testimony, and then I'll, I need to wrap up. We're getting late already. But My son, Nathan, most people know as um, Dr. Barclay's pilot. When he was a kid, we'd get real busy at the ministry. And I would go in sometimes on a Friday evening or maybe a Saturday morning, and I'd put a whole folder together when Pastor traveled. It was called his trip folder. In there was like, if he came here, your church name, church address, church phone number, 
Um, and then it would be the hotels, all the confirmation numbers, and then the schedule of the meeting. So people weren't trying to call pastor when he was preaching. You know, you have 30 staff, somebody wants something all the time. Amen. Not, not to mention the 600 or so preachers that were underneath his care. His phone was always ringing. So my job was to get all of that together, and then I would, I would give it to the staff so they would have a, a copy of not some of the information, not the personal stuff, but the schedule and if they needed to send something to the hotel for pastor. So all of that was there, and they had the information. Amen. And then I would take and I would give some to his family, and then, of course, a, a final one to Dr. Barclay. Well, let's say Friday night would come, and, I'd, and they were leaving Saturday morning. I'd take all the final information, go into the office. So I used to take my son and my daughter with me, they were just little shavers then, and I'd take them into the church office, and my printer, or the printer was in a common area out there, it wasn't in my office. So whenever I'd hit print, I'd say, Nate, run out to the printer and get that for me. They're just this high. So he'd race out there, and I'd say, Kendra, now you go get that one for me. She'd run out there, and they'd race each other, and they'd laugh, and they'd giggle. We made it just a big family thing. Turned it to just be a good, fun time. When I take them and I drop them off at pastor's house, maybe get them a snack or something, you know, they're still kids. And, and we just, we had a blast doing it. About two or three years ago, I preach a conference every year for a guy by the name of Chuck Eveline. I do Sunday morning, Dr. Barclay flies in and he does Sunday night, Monday night. Then I, I stick around, I do Tuesday morning and then there's a series of other pastors that preach the rest of those, those three days. They have a week of meetings. So I'm there before pastor arrives, and then I'm there once he leaves. So Monday night, he heads for the airport. They get on the ministry plane, and he can be home to Midland in 45 minutes instead of the eight hours it's going to take me to drive it. The plane isn't a toy. The plane is time. You're, you're spending the money to buy time, right? Uh, the, this morning today, just pastor did a funeral in our church because you can't schedule when people die. Funeral in our church, then he flew. He'll be in one church in, in Kentucky Sunday morning, another one Sunday night, and then he'll head to the conference over in Clarksville, Tennessee, Sunday night after he preaches two meetings and did the funeral this morning. You can't do that in a car. And you can't do it on commercial airlines because they don't go everywhere you need to go. Because a lot of the churches are in rural America. Amen. They're great people. They have to live in a metroplex to be, have a good church, but they just didn't. Anyway, short version. So Monday night, I, I went into the grocery store and I'm getting a couple of things and I'm walking out of the grocery store with my bag and I can hear this plane, all the motors going. And I know this is kind of a rural area. That's got to be pastor's plane, right? It's got to be pastor's plane. Pastor Pittman, that plane came up to about 800 feet. It was doing about two or 300 miles an hour. It, it gets a, sorry, it gets up to about 800 feet. It banks left and it heads north. And I'm looking at that. And every parent, you'll know this feeling. I'm saying to myself, that's my son. My son is flying that plane. Yesterday, he was running to the printer in the office to help his father in the helps ministry. And today, God, say God. God is using him to take the prophet to the nations. Because God sets up win-win situation. If you'll help me, I'll help you. I'll connect you not with the man, but with the man's God. I'll help you learn, Peter, how to hear from God. And when you walk along, your very shadow fisherman will heal the sick and cleanse the leper and take demons out of people's lives but you got to follow me to see it happen. Father, bless these that have come tonight. I have more testimonies, Lord, as you know, but we are out of time. Some of these that are here, they could tell testimony after testimony tonight too, all of us describing the goodness of our God. I pray, Lord, that we will surround this leadership as a great team for our God. The Matthews, the Peters, the Jameses, the Johns, Every one of us is going to come around this leadership now, find our place, our skill, our gift, our anointing, and recommit. Say that word with me. Lord, I recommit. Lord, I recommit to the things of God now to be better at what I do in this house, to do it with more diligence and more excellence. 
And if I'm inconvenienced, then so be it. Things can change at home. But we have to make sure we keep the pastor's arms strong. I give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Can you say amen, everybody? Give the Lord a good hand clap. Pastor, thank you for your time today. Wasn't that wonderful? Why couldn't everybody come to hear that? Change your life. Praise the Lord. That's so good. That's where it's connected. You know, Samuel, just a kid, just weaned. They say five years old or seven years old, whatever. God raised him up to be a prophet, changing the guard, changing going from priest over to the prophet. And Eli and the whole house there, the church backslid, but yet that's where God set him. And being set there in the ministry, he heard God's voice. Oh, why couldn't God speak to him over at his mama's house? He was safer there, his mama taking care of him. He, uh, But he took him away from that and put him over, over where God's system is where God's order is, where God's house is. Regardless of what the how the house was, God still set him in there. And people say, well, I can't go there. Yeah, well, where'd God tell you to go? What'd God tell you to do? Well, there's a lot of stuff going on over there. But is that where God told you? Look at Eli and Hop Nine Phineas. My goodness. But that's where Samuel grew. That's where Samuel heard God's voice. That's where he became a great prophet. For God set him. But people think, well, I don't like that. I'm going to set myself over here, go over here. It, I think Numbers 23 or something said, God raised up a man. He took him out and brought him in and took him back to lead the people in. See, I, the Bible teaches you, you will not get to where you're going without a man or woman of God. You won't. It's God's system. It's God's way. It's an order. Just like David did, he said last night, after the due order. You didn't do it right. You want all the benefits, and you want, but you don't want to do it God's way. Your business, everything you have comes out of the church. Comes where a man of God or wherever he, God has set you. And he blessed that, and you do that right, and God takes care of you. And he blesses your business, your home, your marriage, everything, if you do it right. But we're not going to do it our way and get it. Amen? Praise the Lord. Don't you love Ray? I like to hear Ray. He's excellent. Excellent. And he came up right. He did it right. Came up to pro and he'll have a great ministry. It won't ever fail. Whatever was born of God overcomes the world. And his ministry was born of God in the proper order in the house of God under the man of God. It was birthed by God, and it won't fail. Can't fail. And he'll, you watch him, he'll have a great ministry. And does, amen. All right, praise the Lord. In the morning Sunday. So uh, you know what you do on Sunday, don't you? You go to church, glory to God. All right, bless you. Go back to Ray's table and buy all this stuff. Amen. Praise the Lord.